this country is full of the most amazing women doing incredible things. And I try and find them and bring them onto the show so we can hear how they've done it. And I'm so excited about my guest today. I'm joined by Susie Ma, who is the founder of Tropic Skincare, an incredible entrepreneur who started her business at the age of just 15 years old. Some of you might know her because she went on The Apprentice back in 2010 and was a finalist and subsequently became a business partner with Lord Allen Sugar. And others of you will know the brand Tropic Skincare through her incredible network and community of 20,000 ambassadors. Susie, I'm so happy to have you here today. Welcome. Oh, Tash, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. So 15 years old, you started your business. You started Tropic Skincare. Tell me what was going on for you at that point. How does it? I have a 15 year old and the chances of getting my son to start a business are zero. Oh. Who were you at the time and how did you do it? I think that's amazingly enterprising for a 15 year old to oh. set up a business. Thank you, Tash. I suppose I was really inspired by my parents. They'd always been very entrepreneurial. They had their own business. And when I was 15, I'd, I was already working with my mum at Greenwich Market. So she used to sell toys and souvenirs. And over the weekend, I would go and help her on her stall to help shift more stock. Um, but I suppose I felt really the need to start up a business because we were just not able to make ends meet. You know, my mum worked seven days a week. She worked 12 hours a day and she couldn't have worked anymore. She's the most amazing hardworking person, but we were always so behind on our bills. Uh, we used to get these letters with like the red stamp saying overdue. I just remember one evening, my mum saying to me, I don't know if we're gonna be able to make it in London. Like it's so expensive. And maybe we need to look at going back to Australia. Um, and actually my mum and I moved over here to the UK from Australia two years prior because my parents got divorced and we were trying to become independent and be away from my dad. And the thought of having to go back to Australia to be in this very unhappy environment was just, it was just for me like the last straw. And I just said to my mum, we're gonna make this work. I'm gonna help out. Like I know there's more that we can do. And I know that I can help earn some more money so that we could live here and stay here forever if we wanted to. Oh my God, Susie, that's and making so emotion. <laughs> I can't even imagine experiencing that at, at 15 years old yeah. and then feeling that you could step up and have it. Was it quite frightening seeing like money running out and those unpaid bills around you? Yeah, it was, it was frightening until my mum almost gave me like an ultimatum for us. I think my mum always thought that as the mother, it's all on her. You know, if she couldn't provide, that was it. And I think when I was a child, like that's probably what I thought as well, like the adult does everything. But it wasn't until I saw my mum doing absolutely everything she possibly could and still be in a position where we would have had to go back to Australia to that very unhappy environment that I, it just something inside of me just clicked. And I think sometimes you have that moment in your life where it's like fight or flight, right? And it yeah. was just a moment of, no, we're gonna fight this. Like we can do this. And I remember saying to my mom, like, we are gonna live in a beautiful house one day. We're gonna have all the money we need one day. And we're not gonna need my dad or anyone else. Like we're gonna be strong and independent ourselves. And we're gonna make this happen. And she just looked at me and she was like, okay, Susie, like I was 15. So she looked at me like a little girl and she just said, okay, well, we'll try for another month and see what happens. And what did you do then? Well, I, I actually thought I had this idea when I first went to the UK to start up a business yeah. um, selling a body scrub recipe that my grandmother used to make in Australia. And it was this beautiful blend of sea salts and jojoba and macadamia oils blended with these essential oils of lemon myrtle and eucalyptus. And she used to make this in Australia to help soften my skin, but also to prevent mosquito bites and also to scratch the mosquito butts because I used to like claw at my skin and she was like use this salt scrub and it will alleviate the itchiness but also it will like soften your skin and prevent mozzies from biting you again. So I used to think oh what if I can make this body scrub and sell it at Greenwich Market with my mum. So I had this idea when I was 13 and I just never really did anything about it and it wasn't until my mum had that conversation with me that we probably had to move back that we weren't going to be able to make it in the UK that I was like I'm going to start this business. I'm going to do it. And so that's what I did. So I asked my mum to lend me some money. She gave me 200 pounds out of the very little that she had left. 
And with that money, I bought the cheapest packaging that I could find, which were jam jars. And then I filled them with my grandma's recipe. I tweaked it a little bit to make it even better. Um, and then I decided to call the product Tropic because of the tropical origin of the ingredients. We used to live in, uh, in Cairns in tropical North Queensland, Australia. I took my jam jars to Greenwich Market with my mom. I waited for a stall and then I started selling. You know, I, I just, I invited people to come in so I could do a demonstration on their hands. So they could feel how soft and silky their hands felt. And then, yeah, and the one by one they bought. And you know, I, I set out that very first day hoping to make 80 pounds in profit yeah. because that was the water bill that we needed to pay off. But actually at the end of that first day, I had 50 body scrubs. I took one out as a tester, so I had 49 to sell and I sold them all at 20 pounds each. That was 980 pounds on my first day trading as a 15 year old. Oh my God, there is so much about your story, <laughs> Susie, that is incredible. One thing I want to say is I do think markets are the most amazing breeding ground for yeah. entrepreneurship. Yeah. You know, I'm quite involved in Portobello Markets through one of my businesses, the Notting Hill Company. I see so many 12 to 15 year olds experiencing that stall environment. And yeah. I think it's a game changer for them. And it obviously was for you being yeah. exposed to the market environment. Oh, it's amazing. And the, the what it does to your confidence, Yeah, you know, to stand, but in, to front stand in front of exactly. someone and just talking. Yeah. I, I literally think it's something that all children should have to do is go into yeah. the market and stand in front of the public and talk. Yeah. But back to your success on that day, 900 pounds. 980 pounds, almost a thousand pounds. What did your uh, mum say? What did you, what were you both thinking? It was just, at the end. it was just unbelievable. I remember coming home and it was all in cash. Was she with you at the time? Is so she... she was working on another stall. Okay. So we, so we drove, so she drove me together with her. Yeah. So she set up her stall, I set up my stall. So yeah, so she was there. And uh, it was just the most amazing feeling, Tash. Like I just, I think it was that night that we just realized that actually we could do it, that there was hope, that there was a future for us. And I remember that evening I said to my mom, like, this is it. And I actually drew a picture of the house that I was gonna buy for her. And I stuck it to the back of our front door so we would look at it every single day. And, I, and, I, and this house that I drew for my mom, it was just, it just represented freedom, security, safety, you know, and, and all the things that we really craved back then. And I remember drawing this picture and my mom was like, it's a big house, Susie. And I was like, yeah, it's a big house. It has a chimney, has a front garden. There's your bedroom, there's my bedroom in the windows. And 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 yeah. And I, I think I that really must be very interesting it. for your mother as well, because most parents instinctively feel they have to do it. Like you said, you know, the adult does everything, the parent does everything. The child just presumes the parents got it sorted. Yeah. Um, she must have felt mixed emotions to her daughter stepping up in this way. Yeah, I suppose. You know, my mum for me, she's she's the most important person in my whole life. She's unbelievably strong. She's always stepped up for other people and always for me. She's been my rock like since I was a child. And so it just felt like it's now my turn. Like 15, you're old enough to do stuff. Right. Well, you obviously were. Like, but you are, like yeah. at 15 years old, you know, back in the day, when you're 15, you get married, you have children, yeah, you're, yeah, you know, yeah. you're a woman of the household. So. I don't know, like I just, I felt grown up enough at that time that I could help my mum and, and we worked together. So after that point, we made body scrubs at home after school, after doing my homework together. I'd be blending the ingredients. My mum would help to put the caps on and help me with the labeling. And we drive up together every weekend. So you started doing the market store. every weekend. Yeah, And were you exactly. able to make that sort of money consistently and more? Uh, not every weekend did I do that, but I did average about a thousand pounds a weekend, wow. every weekend. So that was a real game changer for your family. It was massive, like masses. And to think, you know, I would, and I, you know, I was working seven days, so five days at school, and then the weekends I'd give up what I would do with my friends and go to the markets with my mum. But the money that we would get in, that was enough to not only pay for the rent and pay for the bills, but also save up for a deposit. But more than that, you know, you talked about the markets and how that's an incredible environment for yeah. young entrepreneurs. You know, for me, I, I thought, you know, how could I, how could I expand? How could I save up a deposit like faster? And so I started getting my friends involved. I got my friends working in Portobello Market, Spitalfields Market, I had Canton Market going on as well. And, and I paid them on old? commission um, from, yeah, from about 15 onwards. I got them involved very quickly. Yeah. So my, my ex, at the, my boyfriend at the time then, he was an amazing salesperson and I put him in various markets and, and especially over the summer school holidays, 
like they loved it, like 20% commission. If you're doing 500 pounds a day worth of sales, like selling body scrubs, and we had yeah. body creams later on as yeah. well, that's 100 pounds. Yeah. You're getting into your pocket, like as a teenager. Oh, it's brilliant. Back then, like, even now today. Even like, now. Be, back then, it's a yeah. huge amount of money. And so I would train them up how to sell the products, how to, you know, how to pitch, how to get the products in people's hands. Because once you got it onto people's hands, because it smelled so amazing and felt so amazing, it sold itself. So you just had to have the confidence. I then I then started getting people in who are actors, who are performers, who have the confidence to approach people. And yeah, and, and very quickly we saved up enough money for that deposit. And how long were you doing the markets for? For quite a long time. So I did it, so I was able to buy my mom the house when I was 17, actually. Buy the so house? Two year, so yeah, so not the whole house, but yeah. I put a deposit down yeah. to get a house and to get um, a mortgage and everything. Um, by, so after two years of starting, but I didn't leave the markets until probably about the second year of uni. So I then went to university, and the, but I did carry on and I still had people working with me. And then with that, I was able to buy an investment property ahead of the London Olympics, because um, I, I wanted to keep on like investing in properties and in our wealth so that we could be stable and secure for the future. Susie, that is the most incredible story. And I'm sure everybody hearing that will be absolutely gobsmacked. And although I knew some of your story, I never realized the full pressure you were under or how you stepped yeah. up to solve it. Yeah. How did that make you feel? Just, just like anything is possible. And I, and I take, I think in life, sometimes when you step out of your comfort zone and you do something and you work really hard at it, because, you know, I make it sound easy, but it was really tough. There yeah. were days when I would make nothing. There were days when you know, sometimes like the market store tables aren't very good. Sometimes my tables would collapse and my jam jars would smash all over the floor. And I have loads of rejections, you know, for every, for every one customer that stops to try my body scrub, 10 would say no to me. And for every 10 people that try, maybe like just a few will buy. So I face so much rejection, but when you come out of it the other side and when you achieve the thing that you really wanted to achieve, it makes you feel invincible. So I have this feeling now in life that whatever I want, whatever I truly want, I can make happen. Like where there is a will, there's always a way. And even if you have no resources, because I didn't have a team back then, no. I didn't have any real business support or knowledge. You know, I, you just make it work. Like if you're really, really determined, you'll be resourceful enough to make anything happen. And so that's that's my kind of belief in myself and in life. And I believe that for everybody. And from that experience, that's completely shifted my belief system and my, and my mindset until now and, and forevermore. And how did you then transition? So you, you did the markets till around uni time. How did you then transition away from the markets and where did the brand go to next? So I actually quit Tropic altogether um, in my second year of uni. So I studied philosophy and economics at um, UCL. And the reason why I did that degree was because you know, Tropic was never supposed to be a forever thing. It was, in the beginning, it was only supposed to be a means to an end to help pay the bills and to help me get a job and fund my way through university that would get loads of money so I could buy my mum that house. Yeah. Tropic was never supposed to buy my mum the house. It just ended up doing it uh, much sooner than I anticipated. And I remember when I was at school, I asked my, um, there was a career advisor that came in and you had to do this test to figure out what you are supposed to be doing. And I asked his career advisor, I was like, look, money is really important to me. <laughs> like, I didn't grow up with a lot of money, but I want to make sure my mom and I have money. So what job do I need to do um, to get the most amount of money fastest? And she said, you should go into investment banking. Yeah. And she said, in order to go into investment banking, um, you need to do some kind of degree in economics and you need to do maths and your A-levels and, um, and whatever investment banking you do, if you do something flow-based, so if you do like FX trading, uh, foreign exchange trading, like that will get you a lot of money. So I actually followed that exact path. So I quit Tropic when I was in my second year of uni to focus on my degree, completed my degree, and then I went straight on to um, an internship at Citigroup trading FX. And I was there, I remember being at my desk at 21, had eight screens in front of me, any investment bankers will know what I'm talking about. Eight screens of Bloomberg and all the chats and all the charts going on. And just feeling like I wasn't supposed to be there. Right. And you know those moments in life where you're like, I'm just, I just don't fit, or this just doesn't feel right. 
I just wasn't enjoying what I was doing. And I also lost my purpose because the whole reason for getting into that job was so I can earn enough money to help my mum buy this house. But I'd already done that with Tropic. So I was sitting there not really sure why I was there. And I remember one of my friends sending me a message on Facebook with a link to apply for The Apprentice. And it was the first year they changed the process from a 100,000 pound job with Lord Sugar to a quarter of a million pound investment yeah. in your business. And she, she knew I wasn't enjoying my job. And she said, Susie, I know you're not enjoying your job. Um, and I know how much you lit up when you were doing Tropic and you haven't been doing it for a while. Why don't you apply for The Apprentice to get some investment? And I remember thinking, and, I, and this is how I approach life, you know, go for every opportunity. If you, if you just open as many, like go for as many doors as you can. If one opens, then go through it. Like just, but just try everything. So I thought, what's the worst that can happen? Let me apply and just see what happens because I, I miss Tropic so much. You know, what we were doing at the markets with my friends, I just felt like we were making customers feel soft and happy with the, fre with the essential oils we were using. I love the connection. I love the customers coming back to me, the ones that I knew time and time again at Greenwich Market. It was just, it was hard work, but it was yeah. so much fun. And I wasn't having fun. I agree. The market money. environment is extremely it's fun. It's so fun. You know, yeah. I always feel you get to talk to your customers and so many brands don't. And I always think that's amazing that you get to stand there and see them and you see them in real life experience your product, exactly. which is an amazing privilege and give you feedback live. It might not always be great. It might, they might not buy, exactly. but it's like, at least you get the chance to have that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And you feel, you feel like you're really giving people a service because yeah. I was giving hand treatments. I was chatting to people about their lives and what they were up to. And my old customers would come back and I just loved it. I just loved it. So I missed it. And I thought maybe one day I will go back to Tropic. But yeah, let's let's give The Apprentice a try. Um, and you mentioned earlier, long story short, uh, I went on the show. I didn't win The Apprentice. I got fired in the final. But Lord Sugar got in touch and he invested anyway into a 50% partnership with me. So, so um, Tropic had kind of stopped and then started again, yeah. thanks to Lord Sugar. Yeah, exactly. But I feel like you bought, you've bought a lot of your, even the way you had your friends going out and selling the product, doing stores, that's kind of continued in the brand with the network of ambassadors, hasn't exactly. it? So exactly. you bought a lot of that that you'd already done back into the business. Yeah. So what actually happened was when, when Lord Sugar and I became partners, we were looking at you know, where to market, how to sell, what we were yeah. going to do. He invested 200,000 pounds into the business. So 200,000 pounds isn't a huge amount of money to open up a shop or do a huge amount of advertising or buy enough stock to, you know, start selling to big department stores yeah. and things like that. So we had to be really, um, we had to be really scrappy with the way that we were doing things in the beginning. And I actually went back to doing shows and events and markets for a little bit when he first invested. But very quickly, I started to realize that we needed to really to scale. And it was then that we had um, a, a few people that got in contact with, with us who were a part of Richard Branson's Virgin V Cosmetics business. And they just folded, actually. So they had kind of displaced a lot of their consultants with nowhere to go. And a few of them came to me and said, Susie, you know, like Richard Branson, Alan Sugar, they're kind of similar British entrepreneurs. Like he's just a <laughs> man. Yeah, man. Lord Sugar's just invested in skincare. Like, would you guys be interested? in starting into social selling. And I remember not really knowing much about the model. I heard about Avon and what they did. And I remember Lord Sugar and I looking into it and speaking to these women and it just, it just made perfect sense. You know, I felt like it was so similar to what my friends were doing anyway, yeah. selling our products on commission. It meant that we could continue to make our products fresh and send them to them, you know, as and when we, because we were making small batches at that time. And also it was really great for cash flow uh, from a business perspective, because if we sold to third party retailers, we often had to give them all the stock and you had and to wait, wait three months to wait, yeah. right, for the cash to come in yeah. and cash was really tight back then. So I thought, let's, let's give it a try. But Lord Sugar and I really spent uh, like a full year looking through the commission plan and the structure of the business to make sure that it was really generous, it was really motivating and that we really focused on the most important element of the business, which was our ambassadors. And then we officially launched on May the, 13th, uh, May the 4th, 2013, with 400 customers who became our founding ambassadors. And those women, man, they completely light up my life. They're incredible. Yeah. You now have 20,000 ambassadors. Yeah. So 20,000 women across the UK have 
are out and about selling your product, yeah. all having been through similar types of training, I imagine to what your friends went through yeah. when they before they went to Portobello Market for you. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it's a, is that, that's a staggering number of ambassadors, 20,000. You must have really changed a lot of their lives. Yeah, I really, we get stories through all the time. And you know, more than anything, on top of the commission and the earnings they make through Tropic, through building their own business, yeah. it's the confidence they get yeah. of doing something off of their own back. It's the community they they join when they join a group of like-minded women who all want the same thing. And you know, we celebrate them, we party with them, we throw events, we recognize them, we parade them down the catwalk, and they feel amazing with us, and we make sure they do. And so. I'm incredibly proud of the community that we've built and it's been very organic in terms of growth because that 20,000 started from the original 400 customers yeah. that we emailed, that we contacted and you know through the through the contacts of the initial consultants from Virgin V. And it's just it's just been an incredible journey. You know, we haven't needed extra funding or we've never really advertised for ambassadors or really spoke about the ambassador opportunity like through like social media or anything like that. It's just all grown through word of mouth. So we're going to go on a quick trip down memory lane and you've very kindly bought some photos of key moments in your business journey to share with us. Yeah. Would you mind showing them to yeah. us? Yeah. One of the photos that I really wanted to show you actually is um, something that I always thought I couldn't do. I always thought I could do anything I wanted, you know, business wise, but I always thought I was not physically strong enough to be active. I was always you know, the kid that was last in all the races at school. I was the last to be picked. And I remember there was one moment where Tropic was featured in the Fast Track 100 and it was sponsored by Virgin. And I went to this event and Richard Branson stood up on stage and said, congratulations, you top 100 fastest growing business owners in the UK. Um, I've got a new challenge for you. I am gonna be doing a like a, a, this charity event we're going to be going to Morocco. We're going to be climbing to the top of Mount Tubcal. We're going to be mountain biking through the base of the Atlas Mountains for a few days. Um, it's going to be really tough, but you know who's going to stand up and do this with me? And then as he was asking people to stand up to join him on this challenge, all these guys started standing up, not one woman in the room. And I just stood up and went on this trip with Richard Branson. I trained really hard. I trained three hours a day, five days a week and then ended up doing this event and I've been doing this Strive Challenge every single year. And so one of the photos that I wanted to share with you was that the following year, I actually spent a month cycling for like 16 hours a day some days. We did the Tour de France routes through, uh, through France, we did the GR20 through Corsica, and then we ended with the summit of Mont Blanc, which was the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life up to that point because it, we were exhausted. It was day 30 consecutively. We were right at the top, day 30 completely exhausted. But what was amazing was that we did it for this incredible charity called Big Change, um, which is Richard's, which is Richard's, son, yes, Richard's yeah, charity. Yeah. And they really helped to empower young people yeah, in the UK. Yeah. And we raised over a million pounds for them during that month. But that that's one of my proudest achievements in my life to kind of feel like, you know, I, I can do this, I can do anything. Well, coming back to someone who can do anything, we've also got a photo of you when you were 15. Was this one of the very early Greenwich Market photos? Yeah, that's it, that's exactly it. How does that make you feel seeing that now? I actually get quite emotional thinking about it because, yeah. I mean, that's just a young girl going out to help her mom, which is yeah. incredible. I think back to that girl and she worked so hard. And I remember no matter what happened in that day, you know. I would get rejected so many times. And as you know, everyone in life, you get rejected constantly, but at a market stall and you're trying to get people to stop and something, you know, that was a summer month. So I was probably having a good day there, but in the winter months, when you're trying to get people to stop, it's freezing. take off their gloves so you can wash their hands. No one wants that, you know? And, and so I think about all the rejections that I face. I think about my dirty bucket of dead skin cell water that I had next to me as I was emptying my, my bowls. Um, yeah, and, and but also feeling incredibly proud of her. That is absolutely incredible. Yeah. And then talking of children, you also do, Tropic does so much work to help children, doesn't it? And yeah. I think you've got some other yeah. in your memory lane. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I mean, you're supporting multiple projects around the world. Exactly. So one of our infinite purpose today is to help create a healthy, greener, more empowered world. 
And I learned not so long ago that actually more than 65 million children around the world don't have access to even primary school education. And that's just not right because it means, you know, what does it mean if you can't ever read or write? You can never be anything more than, you know, the, the basic job that you're doing, yeah. whether it's in farming or whether it's in fishing. And so I partnered with this amazing charity called United World Schools. And we try to go into these really remote villages where, you know, the kids and the kids have never had an opportunity for education. So it means their parents don't know how to read or write and nor do their grandparents because these villages are so remote and so out of the main urban areas. And we build a school there and we give them a new opportunity for life. We try to break that poverty cycle from the source by really empowering these children. That we and see. the last place you've got is your ambassadors for yes. a recent event. Was it this weekend? Yes, exactly. So our ambassadors are just amazing. We had, we had the biggest event that we'd ever done. We celebrated 4,000 ambassadors on stage. We had about 500 that tuned in at home because we did it virtually as well. So Susie, for the women who are watching this and men, what would be your overarching piece of advice to someone who thinks they can't do something? Because I feel you've just illustrated multiple ways in which you have faced that fear and overcome it. Yeah, thanks Tash. And you know, it's not just me. It's there is, If you look into history, look at like the real like the real role models of this world like they all started from nothing but when you speak to these people you learn about their journeys you realize that they're so fearful like i was terrified in the beginning when i first started my business i had so much doubt in myself you know and i failed so many times i've made a million and one mistakes and so has every other person that's yeah. successful and i think it's just really realizing that no you're not going to get things right the first time that yes, you're gonna be scared. Yes, you're gonna be stretched. You're gonna have moments where you're gonna be breaking down. You're gonna be crying. You're gonna be questioning, why the hell are you doing this? And you're gonna be rejected. There are gonna be people who won't believe in you, who tell you that you're not good enough, that your idea is not gonna work. You're gonna have all of that, so expect that. But if you can overcome it and be really focused on what it is that you want to achieve, you know, if you can visualize that, I stuck that picture of the house that I wanted to buy for my mom. I drew a picture of it and I stuck it to the back of our front door so I could look at it every day. If you're focused on your ultimate end goal, there is nothing that will stop you. So my advice is to really hone in on your why, really figure out what it is that drives you, what it is that's gonna give you the life that you believe you deserve, and then let nothing stop you until you get there. Susie, what an amazing story. I have to say, I knew how you impressive you were, but I did not know quite how impressive you were. <laughs> oh, thank thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story and congratulations on everything. Oh. I just can't wait to see the rest of the Tropic journey. Thank you so much for having me, Tash. You're a massive inspiration to me as well. So oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your time.